You are listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar. Today, finally, we're in Paris. Hello, I'm Lionel Burney, and we have arrived in Paris on the final Sunday of the Tour de France. Hello, Daniel. Hello, Lionel. Hello. Rich- oh, no, Richard's not here. No, Richard isn't here. Richard is in Glasgow, or on his way to Glasgow for the Commonwealth Games. We've found a little pavement cafe, uh, actually quite a chic-looking wine bar, got quite a nice wine list. Um, we've ordered some a cheese salad for lunch, I think, with uh, the, the, the recommended white wine that goes with it. Is that right? It is. Grave. Bordeaux. Very nice. So we're looking forward to that turning up. Uh, there's about an hour to go in the women's race, La Course, which is taking place a few streets over from here. Uh, we're not far from the Place de la Concorde and the Rue de Rivoli. And we've arrived just to wrap up the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar. And we're going to recap the race a little bit. Daniel, what are your outstanding memories of the Tour de France 2014? I'm just looking at the papers um, from this morning, Lionel, and um, obviously we've got summaries of, of yesterday's events. We keep very, very excited about the performance of the French riders yesterday. The headline on the front page is Goose Pimples, roughly translated. Um, and they, they're talking about what an emotional day it was yesterday, watching Jean-Christophe Perrault and, and Thibaut Pinot make it onto the podium. So, I mean, that in itself has been one of the highlights, hasn't it? The, the French Renaissance that we've been talking about for years, sort of bubbling un- under and finally really coming to fruition this year. And then we've also got the Journal de Dimanche, which is Brian Cookson's favourite newspaper. Yeah, and notorious before the tour for breaking the story about Chris Froome's TUE. And um, they've actually got quite a nice interview in there this morning with um, Vincenzo Nibali's father, who has repeated things that he said in various other interviews during this tour about he's going to gouge Vincenzo's eyes out if ever he gets caught doping or ever he dopes he won't be allowed to um, set foot in, in Sicily again um, but that's yeah quite a nice story and also an interview with Julian Absalon the former mountain biker who spent a lot of time with Jean-Christophe Perrault when Perrault was a mountain biker and Absalon is sort of echoing comments by Perrault's team in the last few days to the effect that you know, it's, it's a shame he didn't turn pro on the road earlier because he's someone with um, considerable physical potential and um, this is really his rightful place in the, in the upper echelons of the, of the general classification in the Tour de France. Indeed, well, it's certainly been Vincenzo Nibali's tour, hasn't he? He's led uh, more or less from the start. He took the yellow jersey in Sheffield um, after that late breakaway, a kind of world championship winning-esque escape on the run into Sheffield. Um, before that, Marcel Kittel won the opening stage in Harrogate. Mark Cavendish crashed out, of course, on the first day. That was a big story for us British journalists. And then a few days later, Chris Froome crashed and then pulled out before the race even reached the cobbles. And that, I suppose, looking back, that cobbled stage was where Vincenzo Nibali really put the seal on the Tour de France. He gained two and a half minutes over just about everybody and more. And that, um, that set him up put him in the driving seat before we even reached the Vosges Mountains where of course Alberto Contador then crashed out and that really left Nibali clear to um, take the Tour de France more or less unchallenged would you say? You, you talked about Sheffield there and I remember standing at the finish there and talking to Beppe Martinelli who's um, Vincenzo Nibali's director sportif at Astana and, and you know he was talking about the confidence boost that Nibali had got from winning the Italian National Championship a week earlier and and there was a sense there that Astana were ready to surf the crest of a wave, that you know, they were in one of those sort of mindsets or the, where, where everything just seemed to be going um, exactly right and Nibali was, was making very sort of lucid decisions in races. But on the other hand, it did also feel that you know, their, their tour at that stage had almost been made by Nibali winning the stage and getting the yellow jersey for a day. It was almost as though they didn't really expect too much more out of the tour. And that all changed, of course, when we got to the cobbles and... And Nibali really delivered an absolute masterclass of, of bike handling. And, and Astana, not just Nibali, because um, Jakob Fuglsang was incredible that day as well. And um, from that point, everyone else was very much playing catch-up, weren't they? Yeah, I think you're right there about Astana on the cobbles. They, they really executed a plan there. Luva Westra as well was another, um, another key player in the, uh, in, in, the, in the coup that Astana pulled off that day. But the race really changed completely with Contador's crash. Um, still, the circumstances of that crash are something of a mystery, and not an awful lot has come out in the wash um, to explain what happened. But clearly, the injury has been 
um, significant because we now know he won't ride the Vuelta a España either. So um, we may not see Alberto Contador back at his best this season. Um, but it does set us up for uh, a real battle next year, not just the emergence of Thibaut Pino and Roman Bardet for the French, but the fact that Nilo Quintana, one of the best Grand Tour riders in the world, winner of the Giro d'Italia earlier this season, he wasn't here. And then you have to assume that Chris Froome and Contador and Nibali will all be back to contest the Tour de France again next year. But the, we've seen some new riders emerging, not just Pino and Bardet, but the Polish climber, I suppose you have to call him a climber, climbing specialist, Rafa Maika. And again, it's one of these um, situations where you see a rider like that win two stages and the, and the king of the mountains the way he did. And it, almost his previous career is almost... It's almost forgotten the fact that he finished six and sevenths in successive Giros. So, um, you know, it's not like he's a flash in the pan, but he certainly got his head to ride for himself once Contador um, had to pull out. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of talk in this Tour de France about um, plan B's, plans B. Um, and, you know, Team Sky failed to come up with a, a valid one or a successful one once Chris Froome um, crashed out. Richie Port, we, we have, you know, we always. Sort of harboured some doubts about his kind of resilience over three weeks. Was he going to have a bad day? Was he not? Um, unfortunately for him, it turned out it turned out um, to be the case. He right, right from the Alps, really the state, the first big Alpine state of um He was sort of found wanting. It, it seems it seems to have been due to illness, and he's carried that illness into the rest of the race, and it's really hampered his performance. But then um, you know, Garmin Sharp were another team that were left short they uh, Andrew Talensky also had a very bad day and then um, they couldn't really come up with any um, decent contingency plan until Navadowskos won in the last week but then on the other hand we had one team Tinkoff Saxo Bank really executed a fantastic plan B in the sense that you know, Michael came very much to the fore and won two stages Michael Rogers won in the Pyrenees so they were one of the big success stories of the tour as well in the end Absolutely, and um, just before we tuck into our lunch, uh, just look back at us, some of the other highlights. Marcel Kittel's sprinting, of course, in the early stages, he he tired quite rapidly, and already by I think the stage that left from Arras to Reims, which was run by won by Andre Greipel, he was already not firing quite as strongly as he had been uh, in the previous days. And it remains to be seen. We're still a few hours away from the final sprint on the Champs Elysees here in Paris but it remains to be seen whether um, he's recovered from those mountain stages enough to produce a, a, a stage winning sprint at the end it may well be that we see Alexander Kristoff who won two stages for Katusa the, the Norwegian rider who again another one of these sort of emerging riders who uh, comes to the Tour de France and finds his profile catapulting upwards um, but a lot of people overlooking the fact that he won Milan San Remo earlier in the spring so it's been a tour that has confirmed talent as well as revealed it I think um, and certainly as we've got into the third week of the race with the, the race for the yellow jersey pretty much done and dusted really after well really if we're being honest after the Alps it was uh, Nibali's lead was, was so secure it would have taken a, a calamity which no one really would have wanted to see him get ill or injured or uh, crash so the, the tour was from a overall perspective was done and dusted so it's been about those other those side stories and quick mention for Tony Martin as well who won he turned a road stage into a time trial really by breaking away 50 odd kilometers from the end and then did what he does best in the final time trial from Bergerac de Perigot on Saturday the Telegraph cycling podcast Supported by Jaguar, with Lionel Burney and Daniel Freib. So this is the final Telegraph Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar of the 2014 Tour de France. I'm Lionel Burney, I'm in Paris with Daniel Freib. And yesterday, Daniel, you were paying quite close attention to the Yellow Jersey press conference um, given by Vincenzo Nibali. And uh, it was slightly peculiar, wasn't it? Oh, it's a bit of a shambles, to be honest, Lionel. Um... Usually in press conferences, the stage winner or the yellow jersey sits in a video car by the by the finish line, and you can either, as a journalist, you can either go into the video car and ask questions live, as it were, face to face, or you can sit in the press room and there's a video link up. Um, and translations are usually provided afterwards um, after the press conference if it's in a language other than French. Um, and 
Yesterday, well, as always happens with the winners' press conference or the the champion elect press conference, they actually come into the press room, which used to happen every day on the tour when I first started doing the tour, but now only happens on the penultimate day. And Nibali came in, and people had been provided with headphones beforehand, and there were various different channels. Um, you could listen in various different languages, so there was a real-time translation. Yeah, you could listen in uh, French or Italian or English, or if you wanted, you could listen to the cycling podcast, I think. <laughs> so um, it, it quite quickly became obvious that the, the questions were not being translated very well because Nibali was asked several questions related to doping, and pretty much it, they were pretty much invariably mangled to the extent that... Um, the answer was completely unrecognisable from the question. So, for, for example, I think at one stage, um, Nibley was asked whether he'd be happy for his blood and urine samples to be stored, kept um, after this Tour de France and maybe tested in, in future, retested. And I think his, his response was something along the lines of, yeah, I'm really looking forward to coming back to the Tour de France next year. Um, I'd also like to do the Giro again, but yeah, of course, I'd like to defend my title. Um, and it continued pretty much in that vein, and it, it's it's not great, is it? When um, you know we know how much scrutiny the yellow jersey wearer is under, the the tall winner is under, um, to and there's so much expectation um, that they you know send out a clear message as regards doping. I mean, it's become an it's become an issue again in the last ten days, particularly you know when Nibali um, had been in the yellow jersey for three or four days, people started to ask the sort of doping questions. And, yeah, it's a very important issue. And yesterday, the journalists and also the public were denied the, the opportunity to hear what he really thinks about certain things because of poor translation in the press conference. Well, sticking with Vincenzo Nibali, the big question, I suppose, of this tour is would he have won if Alberto Contador and Chris Froome had not crashed out? It's fair to say that Nibali came into the race as, as a third favourite as best. So over the last two or three days, Richard Moore and myself have been around the start village asking journalists, riders and team managers that very question. The question we posed was, would Vincenzo Nibali have won the tour if Alberto Contador and Chris Froome had not crashed out? Alan Lesaka, Dea, newspaper in the Basque country. Difficult to say. <laughs> I think it uh, will be a, a good battle uh, for the tour with Fromm and Contador. We never know what happens, but... But I think Contador was stronger than Nibali. I think this was the, the tour of Contador, but we never know. Nibali is, is the best, Contador is not here, Fron is not here, and, and Nibali wins the tour clearly. No. Hey, Laura Messiger, Eurosport. Good question. Um, I don't know. He started really, really good. With, I think with his victory in the second stage that nobody was expecting, he was very, very clever. How can you know this? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> what do I think? I'm asking you. Contador was in a super good shape and all the Spanish riders that know him very well said it also. Vincenzo has proved that he's really good in the Grand Tour, so yeah, I think why not? Matt Borden, Velo News. Ah, oh, Richard, you media guys are always trying to stir up controversy in the ranks, aren't you? You just you want me to you want me to speak to this it's, it's pure conjecture but I'll answer it anyway because I love this stuff I think that he would have I think that he took enough on the cobbled stage and has been thorough enough in the mountains to show that he may have lost time to those guys on, on the hardest summit finishes but I don't think they would have taken two minutes out of him over the course of what four four mountain days so I think uh, I think he would have won I think we're seeing the guy who would have been the rifle winner and it's been it's been great to watch him ride because it's exciting and he's not he's not just racing for Paris now he's racing for history Matt White. Totally irrelevant. He's the best bike rider here and he totally deserves a win if he can win by the end of the week. It certainly would have been interesting, but uh, he's proved he's been the dominant force in this year's tour, but it would have been nice for him to go head-to-head with, uh, with those two guys, but that's cycling. You've got to make your own luck, and they certainly did a great job in doing that as well. Oh, hello. In no preparation here, on it. Go on, then. Hit, hit away, fire away. Rod Ellingworth, Team Sky. Yeah, possibly, yeah. Don't see why not. The speed he went up that climb yesterday, I think, was pretty quick. It's the tour, isn't it? And I think part of it is staying on your bike. Has he had a crash? I don't think he's had a crash. So he hasn't had a crash because 
you know, he's just been on his game, hasn't he? And I think that's the difference. Fumi crashed in the neutralise of the first stage last year, didn't he? But, you know, I don't think he fell any other day. So it's one of them, isn't it? I think you you have luck, but you also create your own luck. So I think he's, you know, fair play to him. He's ridden well and he's fit and he health, he's kept his health. Everything just all gone very well for him, hasn't it? Tim Harris, former British professional road race champion, now a driver on the Tour de France. Well, I have to say it's quite a shame that they both uh, crashed out, but uh, the way he's been going, I think it would have been one of the most uh, spectacular tours in the history. Whether they won it or not, we're never going to know, so we'll have to wait until this time next year, I think, because at the end of the day, you can only beat the people who you beat. If other people have fallen off or, or taken more risk on the descent, and if the opposition, for whatever reason, are not here, then it doesn't really detract at all, because the history books will go down that he's uh, won the Tour de France and that's that's forever. Charlie Regalius, the sports director of Garmin Sharp. If my brother was a girl he'd be my sister. I don't know but I'm pretty sure that with the way he's going Contador and Froome would have had their hands full to beat him so one of the three for sure and I think he's going he's going good. Brian Holm, the sports director of Amiga Pharma Quick Step. And hopefully, Nibali. I think he, he rode here last three weeks like a true champion. We saw him on the cobblestones. He was third to Arnberg, and uh, already there he, he was winning the stage to Sheffield. I think from the start he was with the very best, and uh, he got an extremely good team. They always kept him out of trouble. He didn't crash. The excellent downhill is one of the best in the whole peloton. End of the day, I think he would have won the Tour, and I think he's a brilliant winner of Tour de France. Chris Horner, a rider with Lamprey. It would change the whole dynamic of the race to have those two guys still in. Clearly, he's on really good form. Would have been a good show, maybe for the fans at home, something more to watch for the, for the overall. It's been a really good race. I think an exciting race, too, especially for the podium and all that stuff. But whether if he wins or not, nobody knows that one. But he's beat those guys many times in the past, and they've beat him. So it seems to be a pretty fair fight amongst the two. Jan-Peter de Vlieger of Het Newsblad. I would say no. I think he would have been really, really close. I think these two would have a, a little edge on him. Well, I read today that his uh, power outputs are not the same that Chris Froome uh, had last year. Quite close, but not entirely the same. I think he would have been just a little bit behind him. I think he doesn't have the, the acceleration that uh, those two have. He would have been not able to match their, their acceleration. That's how I see it. Marc Sergent, team manager of Lotto Bellasol. Victory was for one of those two. Why not here? If you ask me the same question, I sort of say Nibel is the favourite for third spot. So that says enough. Thomas Carriou, top man in the press office at the Tour de France. We cannot say if uh, he had won, if he would have won the tour. I guess uh, the tour would have been definitely different. Uh, maybe we, we would have had a, a very strong battle between the Contador of Froome and Nibali on, on the Alps and the Pyrenees. Nibali could have won the tour because uh, he has shown uh, much. Uh, power on the mountains, he has shown a very strong uh, attitude uh, on the cobblestones, so I think he's uh, a great winner for the Tour. We cannot complain because uh, it's been uh, 30 years we are waiting for to have two Frenchmen on the podium. William Fotheringham. Yes. Rupert Guinness, Sydney Morning Herald. I think without doubt the Tour would have been a, a three-horse race with Nibali, Contador and Froome. I actually still believe that if, and if is a big word in capitals, but I think uh, Contador would have been the rider who would have won. I think we've seen the strength of his team since, so he obviously had some absolutely exceptionally strong riders on Tinkoff Saxo. Nibley's obviously been strong and so is his team, but I think Contador's team would have been able to capitalise on the energy that Astana have had to use to defend that jersey. You know, Nibley's a guy who likes to lead from the front of a race. He, did, he won the Giro that way and he used his team that way by defending it for a long time. Tinkoff Saxo would have capitalised on that. So I still think he's the guy I think would have, but the winner is the winner. Tom Carey, Telegraph, cycling correspondent. Ooh, I'm... I'm still going to go with, I think Chris Froome would have done it actually, despite, you know, this guy's travails in this race, I think they would have uh, they would have retained their motivation. I think he's still the best Grand Tour rider out there. So Marco Pinotti, BMC. I still think that Nibali 
surely would have been very, very close because uh, at the point when uh, Contador crashed, he, he had two minutes and a half, and so they had uh, already one climb finish, not the hardest one, but he didn't lose any second. And uh, with Froome, the way he came out from Dauphiné, it's fair to say that uh, it wouldn't be easy for them to, to be faster than Nibali because uh, the way the, the season came out with Nibali, he had some problem with the, with the baby born, with the, was a bit, a bit late in the season. He, he picked perfectly for the two while the other. They kind of uh, fight each other a lot during Dauphiné, so this take out a lot of energy. So my opinion, when, uh, when they asked me before the start who was the favorite for the tour, I, I already put Nibali in the top three without knowing anything. So, and then probably it's the, Nibali is the, the level of last year Giro. And uh, if you look at uh, his Palmares in the Grand Tour, the last four years is impressive. He always be finished top, top three. So for me, it's not a surprise. No? David Walsh? I don't think so don't think he would have beaten both. I'm not sure which one might have beaten him, but Contador got one chance on a very short climb to see could he put Nibali under pressure, and he did, and he just at the end broke him. And I thought that was the portent of things to come, but obviously he never got the chance. I think Froome was going really well. On that very first day, well, second day into Sheffield, when Froome made his attack, short little dart on a, on a steep hill, Nibley wasn't able to go with him. Now, Nibley won the stage. He won the stage because after Froome went and everybody had made the, the effort to bring him back, everybody, everybody was vulnerable and they waited for Froome to go and chase him down and Froome wouldn't do it. So Nibali did the intelligent thing. He's ridden really well. He was brilliant on the cobbles. But my feeling from knowing what Froome had done when they had done the recon on the cobbles, that if Froome had been right, he would have done a very good cobble stage as well. Overall, I don't think Nibali would have beaten both. And I think if you put Quintana in there, I definitely don't think because what he did in the Giro, what he did in the Tour last year, would indicate that he's the best climber of all. And there was always so many mountains in this race that if somebody was climbing really well, the time trial was going to be irrelevant. So, Daniel, one very important person that wasn't asked in that package is yourself. What's your, uh, what's your response to that question? Would Nibley have won if Contador and Froome had been able to contest it all the way to Paris? Um, I'm, I'm really, really not sure to give an obvious answer. I mean, what, one phenomenon we saw in this tour, and I think this is, this is very, very relevant to the French riders who did so well, Bardet, Perrault and, and um, Pino. They were, I think, emboldened by Contador and Froome being taken out of the race. And you know, those two riders in particular have a kind of X factor, um, which... I think intimidates certain riders and they, they Pino certainly before the tour felt that those two riders were out of his reach um, belonged to a sort of different a different bracket um, of Grand Tour rider and, and I think Nibali's attitude and, and Astana's attitude was altered obviously by the fact that those two teams were out and not just the riders themselves but their teams you know Sky still had some bearing on the race actually not not a great bearing and um Tinkoff Saxo certainly did, but not in the way they would have done. Um, and we saw a very open race because of Sky's absence in particular. And I think it would have changed the race completely. Having said that, there's no doubt that Nibali was in absolutely superlative condition. He rode to you know the skill level and the management of the race. He was absolutely faultless, really. Um, I think he would have been close to Froome. Um, and, and I think he would have tested Froome in ways that he, he wasn't tested last year in terms of you know um, improvisation attacking in places where Froome perhaps wouldn't have expected it uh, and Contador as well would have done the same Yeah I think that Nibali's win just proves um, something that is blindingly obvious and sometimes uh, journalists get sort of mocked for stating the obvious that in order to win the Tour de France you first have to not lose it and by that I mean don't lose time on silly stages don't get caught up in the crashes which are pretty much routine in the first week particularly um, when everyone's so nervous I mean the there's a number of factors, I think. The fact that Yorkshire was so crowded with, with so many fans, narrowing the roads in places, it led to quite sort of uh, neutered, neutralised racing at times. They didn't take risks when they didn't have to. But it did mean that everybody was racing right on the limit of their nerves and wits, I think, for, for two, perhaps three days with the stage into London as well, because it rained that day. And then they got back to France, and there was a kind of a, almost a kind of a relief that the race resumed 
normality and the Tour de France could kind of begin. And, and that's really when the serious crashes started to happen. And it's when in those moments, Chris Froome's crash, when he looks back, a, a, a nothing crash in the very early stages of a, of a, of a race, um, which caused him problems that, you know, he, he wouldn't have wanted that crash fracturing a bone in his wrist at any time in the race, of course. But the day before the cobbles gave him absolutely no time to, to um, you know, assess the injury maybe get a splint made for it and I mean riders can carry on without with a with a, a fractured bone in the wrist if it's not uh, too debilitating but on the cobbled stage you know that that must have played significantly on his mind and when you look at the the podium and the perhaps the top six places really only TJ Van Garderen had a significant crash he crashed on the stage two I'm testing my memory here it was the day that uh, Sargon lost out by uh, half a wheel, uh, half a Nancy. centimetre Nancy. Nancy. Nancy stage I think six yeah so the day that Mattia Trentin beat Sargon by a whisker um, that was the day that Van Garderen crashed and lost a bit of time um, on the run in I think that's the the, the unifying factor for the top six places on GC is that they, they suffered relatively few mishaps yeah and you know, perhaps not for Nibali, perhaps not for someone who's trying to win the tour, but for places two to six in that first week, you know, it was really about damage limitation. I mean, we saw with Pino, um, he lost time due to bad placement, and you know, the, the old sort of criticisms started to be aired that you know he's a his bike craft is is kind of amateurish and. And you know he was going to lose more time on descents in the mountains, but actually he was he stayed quite cool in in the face of that criticism because I think he knew that you know losing one two minutes wasn't that disastrous and and the most important thing was like you say Lionel he hadn't crashed um, and you know we've seen that we've talked about it before in the tour we've talked about whatever you say about Lance Armstrong his almost miraculous ability to avoid that kind of mishap and you know as we've said on numerous occasions that is very much part of what goes into making a tour winner. You're listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar. Well, we're going to head off over to um, the Place de la Concorde in the area where the team buses will be gathering. We're going to catch up a little bit with La Course, the women's race that's preceded the men's stage of the Tour de France today. Uh, Quite a momentous occasion for women's cycling to have an event that's on quite such a stage as this in the centre of Paris on the final day of the Tour de France. But while we head off over there, here's an interview that we did with Dave Brailsford as the tour came to a close, and he was in sort of reflective mood looking back at the Tour de France, but also um, explaining a little bit the work that Team Sky will do to get their season back on track. So Dave, I remember speaking to you a lot in the 2010 tour, your first ever Tour de France, which which was also a disappointing tour. Are, are there comparable things about this tour and that tour do you think? No. No, I don't think so. Um, I think when you when you start we started out you know we started out with a pretty bold ambition with uh, you know when we started Team Sky it was our first season there was a lot of um, there's a lot to learn really in terms of not so much the actual bike racing itself but the, the behind the scenes stuff you know the, the how to get things moved around and there's an awful lot of work that we were you know burdening ourselves with and um, and I think when we came in for the first time um, we felt that we we looked up the top of that GC and it felt an awful long way away and and it's, it was a bit um, that was a bit scary to be honest and you, you think I mean, wow it's okay. humbling at the time as well the, the, the whole right, experience yeah. I, I think um, anytime you lose anytime you don't win it's humbling the emotion of losing for me or the emotion of not winning for me as a as a person inside me, you know, it's not maybe not how I behave, but inside me, it, it's not pleasant. It's not good in my head um, when we don't win. It's not a nice place to be, and and I think a lot of it is, you know, when people say I don't celebrate winning enough, and people say, well, you, you know, you kind of win and you move on, and and I know it's not a necessarily a good way of doing it, but that's genuinely what happens in my head is that, you know, you set out to achieve something, you achieve something, it's like great, on to the next thing. Um, and I don't feel the need to kind of go crazy about it or anything. But then I, I guess a little bit of it is that the the um, whenever it doesn't go to plan or for whatever reason we don't win, the what goes on, you know, the, it's the avoidance of that in my head and the avoidance of what happens, I think, which is probably the reason I'm still doing... What drives you. Uh, yeah. I mean, you learned a lot in that 2010 tour. Has yeah, there also definitely. been a lot to learn from this one? Um, 
I think it's different since so far as this is our fifth year of doing this. And I think, um, you know, when you're on a, a voyage of discovery as we were in, in 2010, it's like, wow, you look at it and you think, God, there are so many things that we could do better. And that's looking at ourselves, forget everybody else. And, and so you set about that. And I think we, we set about it with a real, you know, there's a, an excitement, there's fear, there's we're not going to go back there and let that happen again. You know, there's all of those kind of emotions that really drive the team on. And some people like that and, and for some people the, the wheels come off you know and, and you kind of start evolving your team and then of course in 2011 we came back and I, and I think we felt that in actual fact the the end of no the start of 2011 was a positive start we actually we, you know Brad got on the podium in Paris Nice which was um, which was great really and, and all of a sudden from having seen looked at any GC and being a million miles off it all of a sudden we're on the podium in Paris Nice and that, that was a real positive um, jolt of, of, of burst of energy that everybody needed and it gives you know, gives you self-belief and I think once you get self start you, your self-belief systems getting in place then you're on a bit of a roll and so then we went on and we generally thought that Brad would be in the mix in um, in 2011 broke his collarbone um, but that year you know obviously crashed out and I can remember the the devastation of that moment when Brad crashed out and it took it took a good couple of days to come to terms with that you know and and to be fair to the lads they went on and, and Eddie won a couple of stages didn't he you know um, which was great you know uh, and then into the welt in 2011 and I think that's where then with Froome and Bradley getting on the podium that's where we thought right this is right this is really doable now and I think that kind of carried us through the winter and of course 2011 was um, was a pretty flawless season in that regard so is it similar no because I think we've got a lot more experience now than we had then and, and we won the tour twice you know and, and you think that's why I said when we came here people saying oh you're going to go and defend your jersey and I think I'm not sure we are we, we're going to try and win it for a third time and um, and that might be this year it might be next year it might be the year after but we want to win it for a third time we're going to keep on trying and I think that's the difference I think you instead of sort of putting a series of performances of an undefeated Tour de France back to back to what extent is that really realistic and I think the, the thing I think what we should be thinking about a little bit more as Team Sky is collecting yellow jerseys that's, our, that's what we want to do and we'll try and collect as many as we can in the, in the time that we've got and, You and mentioned the other day that um, you know you sort of established a blueprint, a formula almost for success the last couple of years and you mentioned that you wouldn't be afraid to look at that again and really yeah. really perhaps even rip it up and, and come up yeah. with a new, a new formula a new blueprint I, I think you're right. I want, you know, and I think what I, what I say there is, you do. You, you kind of um, the danger for us is that you, you kind of come up with a, a system or a method, and you think, right, that works. You do it again for another year, and it works again. And then you think, actually, all we need to do now is roll out this method, and roll out this system, and it'll work again. And it, and it comes and bites you on the arse, quite frankly, because you do, the world's not like that. And so it's this. You know, we talk a lot about this idea of continuously having to rethink and reinvent, and the you know. It's, I suppose it's, it's like many annual seasons, you know, a bit of football season or you know, rugby, whatever else, is that you're actually going through, it's like Groundhog Day. So you've got your pre-season, you go through the motions, the t- tables come out, you, you play the, you know, go to the same races and do the same thing. And I think if you stick to the same formula, all you need to do there is maybe change the intensity of the emotion around it. You get a little bit overconfident or a little bit, you know, a little bit of, you don't quite do all the little things that got you there it takes it takes next to nothing and all of a sudden you know you, you're off you're off the mark however I think we've got to be clear here that I still think if Chris was still on his bike uninjured I think he'd have been there or thereabouts in this tour but you know you can't it's unfair or nibbly to say that you know that to predict anything but he's certainly been competitive whereas in 2010 we weren't competitive so how, how do you do that I mean you, you've famously in the past brought in experts from other areas, even from outside sport. Is that something you'll look to do again, perhaps, to seek expertise, knowledge, inputs from beyond cycling and beyond sport? Well, I've spent most of my last four or five days, I'd say, sitting and, and I think driving everybody crazy, really. In, in, and I spent six hours yesterday in the back of the bus, you know, stuck in the back of the bus with, with Tim and Rod, and I've spent a lot of time with, with you know, the other guys in the team. So yeah, you do. You, you you pick it all apart, and you think about different ideas. And and um, first thing to do is to try and understand um, this performance first, 
and not not have a knee jerk reaction to something and throw the baby out with the bathwater, you know. And then you sort of start start going through a a process, which is um, you look at everything, you can try and throw a spanner in the works and um, throw everything up in the air and see where we go. So was that meeting primarily about looking at this race and what maybe or what could have gone better, or was it looking ahead and uh, and sort of projecting forward? Uh, no, I think I think you've got to start with looking at yourself. And uh, for me, in any kind of process like this, you know, it's all right for me to stand there and tell everybody, you know, well, the first point of reference should always be yourself and everything else. They can't say that without doing it. So for me, you know, I, I've kind of thought about um, very much about, you know, what, how have I done my job? And uh, is there anything I've been missing? And have I done that to the best of my ability? Is it are the lads getting what they need? And, you know, you can kind of go through that first. And because if that's not right, you know, the, the rest won't work, that's for sure. So I think there's a, a start, you, you kind of start with a, a, self, a very critical self-assessment. Have you identified anything that you could have done differently or could have done better? I think you always can, you know. I think, I think at the end of the day we're human. And, uh, you know, we'll be making mistakes right here, right now. But we don't know what they are yet. And at some point in time we'll find out what the mistakes we're making now are, but we're not aware of them yet. So I think as long as you've got that in your mind, it's not, and it's not, to, it's not to call people out, it's not to say... You know, it's not to say uh, you made an error. It's just how can we improve? Um, and for sure, there's lots of different things that you can think. Actually, yeah, we could have done that differently. We could have approached this in a different way. We could have, you know, you just you just look at it all, and um, and 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 think right. We've got to got to change things around. And I think you know, it, it's um, it's interesting when I think about my own situation here. That in the last couple of years, I've spent an awful lot of time an awful lot of time talking about um, doping, sort of defending uh, questions about doping looking at, you know, biological passports and um, and all of that kind of stuff which has been pretty full on to be honest and, um, and whilst I'm doing all that I'm not thinking about performance and I think there's an element, for me personally I think there's an element of, right, I've got to really that's it's hugely important all of that stuff, don't get me wrong but um, it'd be nice to be really able to focus back on, on a key aspect of, um, of performance and, um, and see what we can do. Dave, is, it, is it really difficult to reconcile the need? To, you know, you talked about winning multiple Tours de France and collecting yellow jerseys. Is that not difficult to reconcile with the kind of de- developmental needs of the team in the sense that you know, we've made a point in recent days that you know, Thibaut Pino, one of the reasons he's doing so well now is that he was thrown in in 2012 into a team that you know, had nine spaces up for grabs they didn't have a GC leader to support and he got valuable experience there and um, that's why he's here now, isn't it? I think you could have said that Thibaut Pino was going to be here or in this kind of area about three years ago. We, you know, we, we were very keen to sign him two, two and a half, two years ago, whatever it was. I think, you know, he's an, he was an outstanding young rider and he's one of those guys you think, you know what, he, he, could, he could go all the way. So I think he's, you know, then you look at the talent and the development of that talent and I think... Um, and I think a little bit it comes back to the Yates, if you like, you know, where we recognise that if you've got one of the best riders in the world and you're going to try and win every race you go to, and the way you want to try and win it is have a team that's absolutely dedicated to, to riding in a certain way to try and win, then if you put young guys into that, into that particular team who aren't actually capable just yet of delivering that performance and backing it up, then what you then have is you, you start asking guys, the older pros, as it were, to do a job and a half or a job and a quarter and their job is hard enough as it is and I think what then happens is they'll go well hold on a minute why am I having to do a job and a quarter you know you should get somebody to do that job properly you know and, and, and I think there's all of those little undercurrents if you like all the little subplots that you've got to think about and for the development of, of riders I think that's why in um, the opportunity that the the Yates have had in Edinburgh like, to come here and go on a break and, and race as they have done this year it's been absolutely fantastic for them and, and if, um, if, and I'm sure they will, uh, get to a level where they're competitive in, you know, they'll get, I'm convinced they'll get big, big results. And, and when they do get those big results, you can say part of that is through what they've, uh, what they've learned along the way. On the, on the other hand, you know, I think we do have some fantastic young talents and it's our job to, to make sure we've got a race programme. We talked about it quite a lot, about maybe changing our race programme, doing some smaller races just with a younger group so that they can have that, those development opportunities rather than throwing them in the, you know, in, in the, in the bigger races where you know, we want to go and try and win.
Is this likely to be a big uh, winter of transition for Team Sky in terms of personnel? What, staff or riding? Riders, pe- people and staff as well, but are there, do you expect the, the team to look quite different next year in terms of the riders first? I think next year when you look at the group, the core group that we've got in terms of, let's say, if we want to come back and win this race, you know, I still think that Chris is, is, is you know, one of the most competitive GC riders in the world. There's no reason not to think that. Um, so the question then would be, how do you create a, a group around him which would be able to support him again to come and try and do it again? Um, and in that sense, you know, there might be one or two changes, but, you know, it's not as if we want to go out and sign a, you know, a GC rider. I think um, it would be more, there are certain guys who will naturally move on as you do, and there are certain guys that we've identified who think, you know what, they, I think they would fit really well in this team and, and, um, and, and we'd like to have them. Richie Poor obviously got his chance at, at this tour, it hasn't worked out for him, and he, he was touted this year as perhaps a, the leader of the team at the Giro originally. Um, what's the future for him in terms of individual GC ambitions? Do you see him reverting to a support role? No, I, I think it's been, it's, it's been a real tough one for Richie because I think in many respects, you know, it, it, I think people may feel that, you know, oh, well, he got ill and, you know, it's seen as a bit of a, not, not an excuse in any way, but it would see, it'd be seen as, um, I don't know, it, it detract from his ability, if you like. Whereas Richie, you know, he's a brilliant climber, he's a brilliant bike rider, um, and he got ill. And, and, and that was the issue. And I think people will then assume because he's got ill, then actually there's something else, and he's not, you know, he shouldn't be a GC rider and all the rest of it. And I think it's, um, it's unfair, really. However, you know, the, it still remains for him to prove that that's what he, that he's capable of doing that. But I don't think the door's shut on that just yet. I think there's, um, you know, I think if, to go through a Grand Tour in full health, in full form, and get to the end and go, you know what, I gave him a best shot and I just haven't got it. That's very different from somebody who was running second after ten days. Don't forget, they were hard. That was a hard ten days. That first ten days, and he's second on GC. Which, um, if it had been a ten day race, we said no. It's not it's a bit stupid thing to say. But if it was a week long stage, a ten day, you know, it'd have been there. So I wouldn't write him off because he got ill. You're listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar. Tweet us at cycling underscore podcast. So we've left Paris behind us. We're on the Euro Tunnel back to England. It's Sunday night. The Tour de France is over. A few hours ago, Marcel Kittel won on the Champs Elysees, taking his fourth stage win of the Tour. A little bit before that, Marianne Vos won the inaugural edition of La Course on the Champs Elysees as well. Um, we spoke to Marianne after the race, and here's what she had to say about the first edition of La Course. Marianne, can you start means to see you to win on the Champs-Élysées and how important this is for women's cycling in general? Well, the biggest win of today uh, is, was, uh, is the world is watching uh, women's cycling and the beauty of women's cycling and that uh, ASO gives us this stage to show, to show it. But of course, from the start uh, till the finish, it's just another bike race and... Um, we with uh, Rebel Live wanted to uh, to show our best and show what we we're showing every week. Uh, interesting racing, um, and I'm I'm really happy that I could finish this up. Uh, Marianne, it perhaps doesn't look like the most challenging course, um, you know, laps around the Champs. Um, can you just talk to us about the unique challenges of that circuit? Well, yeah, it's a uh, it's a different style of racing because it's really wide, and then you have the cobbles uh, slightly uphill to the Arc de Triomphe. Uh, it's it's a, it's difficult to uh, to get away because the speed is really high and um, in the bunch it's you're at ease uh, but in front you're pushing really hard so we knew that uh, up front and with the men's it's uh, often I mean, a bench sprint nearly always we try to uh, to make a hard race to keep in control uh, to keep the initiative but um, yeah and I had to save save my legs for the finish. And um, yeah, that was uh, that was the challenge. The challenge is to be in the right position at the right moment. In terms of the women's calendar, we had the Giro Rosso, which clashes, of course, with the Tour de France. Do you feel that takes away some of the um, spotlight from the women's uh, racing? And do you think that UCI needs to get together with race organisers to 
dovetail the women's calendar with men's events so that you get higher profile when you, you're racing in your top races? These talks are already uh, going on um, and that's definitely a challenge. We have a we have beautiful races in the UCI Women World Cup. Um, we have great races like the Giro Rosa. Um, and now you see here in the combination with the Tour de France with La Course um, that it gets a lot of attention and that the, the fans and, and women but also men around the world are uh, willing to see more of women cycling. Um, so yeah, it's a challenge to get a more balanced calendar, uh, calendar and I hope it can be uh, more combined with the men because that gives us this, the stage uh, that women's cycling needs to step up further. Um, so this was a, a great day for women's cycling. Uh, Marianne, before today you've won pretty much everything in women's cycling. There's a new race today, you've won that as well, so you have won everything. Is it hard to carry, well, A, to stay motivated, but also to keep improving? Is it hard for you to you know, feel like you're still working on things and still becoming a better rider? Oh, uh, definitely new races motivate us to, to go further and to, uh, to improve myself and this, this year uh, with the coming Tour of Britain, uh, the women's tour, uh, with La Course, um, so much is happening in women's cycling that that uh, gives an extra boost and uh, helps me also to, to stay focused and to stay motivated. Um, but uh, it's, it's not really difficult because the competition is getting stronger and stronger and to be able to, uh, to stay up there and to catch up uh, also in the team, uh, the team, my teammates are doing so well that you have to have a really good level, high level uh, to be able to, to race for the victory. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's great to uh, to win these races, but um, it also helps me to stay fresh. Podcast daily during the Tour de France. This is the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar. So Daniel, the Tour de France is over. Marcel Kittel won the sprint. He didn't look quite as imposing as he looked in the first week of the Tour, but he's had to uh, lug that big bulky German frame over all those mountains in the Alps and the Pyrenees. Yeah, we said that, didn't we, earlier in the tour that um, this was going to be a really hard route and he's one of the weaker climbers, perhaps one of the weakest climbers in the race and um, he did look tired in the last three or four days and today I think he um, had a lot to thank his team for because they, they delivered him in in a very good position and he looked as though he was struggling at one point in the last 100 metres but he just managed to overhaul Christoph in the end and that's four stage wins for um, for Marcel Kittel. And Navadowskis in third. We did wonder what Garmin Sharp were doing up there. They were obviously trying to deliver him to the line. We are so used to seeing teams really master the Champs-Élysées, really dominate in those final kilometres but it was a free-for-all really wasn't it there were Europe Carver up there uh, Arashiro was on the front for them for a bit Amiga Farmer Quickstep were trying to get involved Garmin Sharp as I said were up there Lotto looked like they had it under control for Andre Greipel but he just didn't have the horsepower at the end and of course Giant were in there they didn't do a spectacular job but they did more than enough to get Kittle to the line but it it, it seemed like um We've seen so many of those sprint finishes come down where it's been the peloton has been in one line in an arrow head sort of formation, but this time it was just all across the road. Yeah, and we've seen that more and more. I mean, we've talked earlier in the tour about how um, a lead out is not necessarily um, it's, it's not necessarily a line of riders with a sprinter at the end, and then the rest of the peloton bunch behind that rider. A, a lead out these days is, is really it can be composed of riders from several teams and there can be multiple trains and it's really just about stretching the bunch out and, and creating space and, and creating room for for the main sprinters to move into and um, yeah, it can look a bit messy at times but um, yeah I thought Giant Shimano did a, did a pretty good job today um, and, and they needed to like I say because Kittle was, wasn't at his best What about La Course? We didn't see an awful lot of it because um, it was a long trek up from Limoges this morning up to Paris and fighting our way through uh, the city I mean you know the Tour de France suddenly appears before you doesn't it when you get into um, the area next to the river and um, you know we caught we caught the end of it and we spoke to Marianne Voss um, afterwards 
obviously a, a good addition to the afternoon's racing really and and something uh, i'm assuming with the live tv coverage it's going to have um, elevated the women's cycling to uh, a bigger audience yeah i mean in a way it would have been nicer if it, the finish had been closer to the men's finish um the publicity caravan for the men's race came in between the two so there's a four hour gap three four hour gap between the two finishes um we, but you know it's a start isn't it and um you know it was mariana voss is is such a great credit to women's cycling you know she could easily have have pointed out the negatives today and uh, you know we heard her there when we spoke to her um but really she was just full of praise for the race and she was very excited and she talks about how um, new races like this are, are, are the spur for her to keep on improving, keep on winning. So, um, yeah, that was nice to hear. Absolutely. So the Tour de France 2014 is over. Vincenzo Nibali, a worthy winner. Uh, Rafa Maika, the king of the mountains. Peter Sagan, the green jersey winner, really since probably day two or three he had that in the bag. And the white jersey in the end went to Thibaut Pino, who's third on the overall podium. Um, AG2R won the team's prize, which... I mean, you'd have got long odds on that before the start of the race, I think. Would you, though? I'm not sure. Would you? Maybe. Um, but they certainly they dominated it, didn't they? They well, absolutely I, did. Yeah, I suppose Perro and Bardet and one other is going to put them reasonably yeah. up there. But I think you probably would have thought that uh, so maybe Sky yeah, or Sax, Tinkoff, Tinkoff yeah. Saxo. But, but there we go. Yeah. Um, I mean, the f- you know, we've talked about it at length, but the the performance of the French riders was a, a massive highlight for me especially um, you know I keep harping on about it but, um, but I think the way Pino kind of overcame the, the demons that sort of surfaced last year in the in the race um, was a great credit to him especially because you know there were a lot of people were even writing him off in the first week and you know he is he is quite a f- he has been quite a fragile character you know to the point where uh, you know, there's been there's been talk about problems he has sleeping and problems he has getting ill before big races and just all the kind of hallmarks of of a rider who is perhaps mentally not as robust as he needs to be. But in fact, he's he's proved that that is not the case. And um, he really came out with all guns blazing. I think I said in the Alps that I really felt that when Contador and and Froome left that he really felt that he belonged in in the sort of exalted company of like the top five in the tour and and from then he just went from strength to strength interviews and analysis we've got the tour de france covered this is a telegraph cycling podcast supported by jaguar before we go we've just got to announce the winners of a few of the competitions we've been running Uh, First up, the framed picture of the Tour de France crossing Cote de Buttertubs in Yorkshire on the opening day of the Tour. Uh, The winner of that is Mark Sinton-Smith. That's Mark Smith on Twitter. If you can get in touch with us via Twitter, we'll organise getting the framed print sent to you. Then we have the pair of Oakleys in the competition we're running on Facebook. And the winner of that is Tom Bradley. We'll get in touch with you on Facebook, Tom congratulations and finally the competition to name the dream tour de france team uh, we set that on our website thecyclingpodcast.com and after a consultation with dave brailsford he wasn't keen to give away too many of his team selection tips but we have decided that the winner is tobias so tobias if you could get in touch with us via twitter at cycling underscore podcast or on the facebook page will arrange for the collection of books. That's Richard Moore's Etap and a complete set of the cycling anthology to be sent to you. Congratulations to everyone and thanks for playing. You're listening to The Telegraph Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar. Well, I don't know about you, Daniel, but post-tour fatigue is already setting in. Um, We have done a lot of driving today. It's always a bit strange in Paris on the last day. The last two years have been quite exceptional for us as British journalists because Chris Froome and before that Bradley Wiggins won which made for uh, the story kind of carried on a bit more for us I guess but there is very much a case of it's the last day of school and the summer holidays are about to start pretty much there's a a high speed evacuation from Paris not just from uh, not just from the media and people working on the race but I think the riders will be relieved to get to the hotel um, you know have a few too many drinks and and catch up with their family and friends Um, but looking back over the three weeks Daniel have you got any outstanding high spots of this year's race 
Um, just the, the, I suppose how sort of dynamic the race was from the start, the racing, you know, from and Nibali really set the tone for that on the second day in Sheffield, just with that uh, that attack um, on the, on the run in there, and and that really sort of lit the fuse, didn't it, for the whole race, and and from there we saw sort of aggressive racing every day, and you know I think thought the route was borderline too difficult, but um, you know I thought maybe. The final Pyrenean stage was one too many to a horse cam just because everyone looked so tired there. But even that day, we had really good racing. Um, personal highlights, pff, um, pff, hotels and things that were you know reasonable standard this year. <laughs> um, my last one in the Dordogne was pretty nice. Um, it's a very nice. I had some very nice runs along rivers, you know, um, in the morning, which I enjoyed. Um, the weather was weather was rotten. The company was excellent, you know, your company, Rich's company. I didn't have the privilege of travelling with you in the car, but it was generally, you know, a delight every time I did see you. Well, you've done more than your fair share of travelling in the car today. What I think we're going to be up to about 10 or 11 hours in the, in the, uh, the comfort of the Jaguar today by the time we get home to London or thereabouts. Um, my highlights, I would say... Um, just a nod to Richard's excellent book, Etap. Um, if you look at the race as a whole, there's one stage that stands out as a possible inclusion in a sequel to Etap, if Richard chooses to do Etap 2 or something, and that's the cobbled day. It was packed with drama. I think when you revisit that you know, in months or years to come, the, the stories of that day will come out and there'll be, um, you know, it will, it will really be a sort of layered account of what actually happened and really you know um, Christian Proudhon made that slightly tongue-in-cheek point about uh, La Planche de Belfi deciding the general classification but really Nibali won the tour on the cobbles because he 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 gained that time on that day Um, and you know he put Contador on the back foot Um, now obviously Contador crashed but um, he still you know he still opened the door on that day and just from my point of view being out there on the last section of cobbles and and trying to capture some of the atmosphere of the day that was probably my highlight if you want to listen to the little package i put together it's in the stage five edition of the telegraph cycling podcast supported by jaguar um so i guess that's pretty much it daniel yeah it's quite sad isn't it it is, but the, the cycling podcast isn't going away. We'll take a little break and we'll be back with weekly episodes and perhaps more regular episodes as the Vuelta a España and Tour of Britain come along. Um, we're working on some plans to that effect. Um, but I guess that just leaves us to thank a few people. Richard Moore, of course, who's not here. He's up at the Commonwealth Games uh, covering the wrestling or boxing or whatever it was he was doing. He's been uh, our consummate host for the past three weeks. Then behind the scenes, we've got uh, John Mooney, who's edited every episode brilliantly for us, and Paul Scones, who's um, been there offering help and support as well. Nigel Brown of Dirt and Glory Media. Who else? We need to obviously Chira. thank. Chira, of course, Juan Emilio, and who's been, well, it's, you know, you can't, words don't really describe. Unique, really. Um, unique. Francois Thomaso as well. Um, a, good, a good addition to the podcast, wasn't he? Absolutely. I think we'll be making and a big money signing, move, yeah. big money move for him for next, uh, next summer. And of course, The Telegraph and their correspondent, Tom Carey, who's been out on the race, and also John McCleary back in London and all the team there. And of course, Jaguar for supporting us um, through the tour. That's been much appreciated too. So, that pretty much is it other than of course to thank all of our listeners i think we've had about three quarters of a million downloads since the tour started which is a fantastic result for us not much abuse either yet not much abuse not much abuse don't (laughs) Don't put ideas in people's heads daniel Um, you know the tweeting has been within the spirit of the game and you know queensbury rules hasn't it it has indeed it's been fantastic to hear from so many of our listeners on twitter and facebook sorry we haven't been able to reply to everyone um but we've been pretty busy doing a lot of driving um and and hoping that we can make it to restaurants in time for dinner but yeah thank you to all of our all of our listeners we're really pleased that you came on the 2014 tour de france with us and we hope you join us again sometime soon you're listening to the telegraph cycling podcast supported by jaguar